non-rock a boatus must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? Brett, delusional. The, the, yeah, I love the jets, delusional. Yeah. Delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! 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 What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go into the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. Well, I, yeah. got, I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when yeah. they're not. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Here it is. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. That's Isaiah 42, y'all. Hey, guys, welcome to another episode of Apologia Radio. This is the gospel heard around the world. You guys can get more at ApologiaStudios.com, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A Studios.com. Go there, get all the additional content, guys. You get all the TV shows, the after shows, hundreds of radio shows and podcast episodes. You get Apology Academy. When you guys sign up for All Access, you partner with Apology at Church and you make everything that we do possible globally, bringing the gospel around the world to all kinds of different communities and worldviews. Um, and you're a part of that. So if you're Apology at Studios first, sorry, Apology at All Access first, thank you guys for partnering with us, being a part of this ministry. If you're not part of All Access, please partner with us, guys. Everything you see, on all of our platforms, whether it's engagement with atheists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, whether it's engaging the abortion issue, whatever the case may be, it's all made possible because mm-hmm. of all of our ministry partners with Apology All Access. So thank you. I'm Jeff, the Comedy the Ninja. That is Luke the Bear right there. What up? That's Joy the Girl. Hello. And as you can see, we have a very, very special guest in the studio with us today. Um, I am I'm thrilled. Uh, so before I, before I bring um, Dr. Damar on um before i bring him on i want to just sort of tell you i was raised in a christian home heard the gospel immediately first bible study ever went to ever ever went to in my life was a little youth group bible study i was 16 years old and i walk in um and i don't know anybody there There there's only a few people there but on the television is an old 70s or early 80s film on the rapture pre-tribulational rapture that's what i walked into my first bible study was on secret rapture seven years tribulation that was my very first bible study and from that point on i was a fiend about eschatology and time stuff i would go to bookstores to get the jerusalem post to see what the new things were in jerusalem like hey y'all know they got the red heifer they got the cornerstone they got it all ready to go any moment I was a freak. I would watch the Hal Lindsey Report every Friday night, I believe it was, or maybe it was Sunday night. I watched the Hal Lindsey Report. I was, I was reading everything eschatology. My Bible college was dispensational, premillennial, and then I started to read the Book of Revelation. Just Lord, help me to understand this. Help me to understand it. I'll take the blinders off. I just want to let everything go and just under- what are you saying? And I committed to read the book of Revelation once a day, every day for 30 days. By day four, I remember I was in Starbucks. I read through Revelation. I closed the book and I thought to myself, what's happening? This can't, this can't be, it can't be future to me. Some of the stuff in here, I, I, it, it, did it happen already? And so then I start reading 
the Olivet Discourse just and fresh. Like, let it speak. No, no, no people teach him. I want to, what does it say? And I started to get freaked out because I thought to myself, this really seems like it had to happen before they all died. Um, and I started kind of panicking because I didn't know anybody in my circle that believed, I, I didn't know it was possible. And thank the Lord, the Lord directed me and guided me to really historic Christianity and many Christians in history, all the way down to the church fathers who were even using the Olivet Discourse and the Great Tribulation as an apologetic against the Jews that Jesus truly was the Messiah. And then I discovered post-millennialism and I discovered some of the giants of the faith and history were all post-millennialists, including the Puritans. And I discovered that the view that I had of eschatology was actually a new view in history and no one had any perspective like it uh, before the 19th century. Um, and so I started to get kind of settled in that mm -hmm. and, and really got directed at that point to two men that became my primary teachers and encouragers in this area of eschatology. And the supremely was Uncle Gary. Gary yep. DeMar <laughs> from American Vision. And so from that time forward, I picked up his books. I was getting his articles, listening to his lectures. And so, Gary, welcome to Apology Radio, brother. It's good to be here. So American Vision dot is it dot com or dot org now? Both. What's the best one? I know it's both, uh, American Vision dot org, and then okay. from there you can get to everything else that's there, the store and articles and so forth. Okay. So as we as we bring Gary on, we start talking about this. We're gonna talk about rapture stuff, post millennialism, eschatology, end time stuff for all you guys that are interested in that. Um, I want you guys to go to American Vision um, and check out the articles, check out the store. I would say. Um, the book that really affected me and really transformed my thinking, Gary, and it was such a huge blessing and help to me because I was kind of in a panic state at that moment, like I don't know anything, um, was End Times Fiction. Oh yeah, okay. End Times Fiction was a little book. Thomas Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, I knew the uh, Mike Hyatt who was with Wogamuth and Hyatt, they had started a publishing house. Uh, one of the first books they published of mine was actually Last Day's Madness, and Mike Hyatt worked for Thomas Nelson, but Wilgamuth and Hyatt eventually went out of business. And he said, he called me up, he said, Gary, oh, actually I got it from a, um, a book agent, uh, but David Dunham, and he said, Gary, Thomas Nelson wants you to write a book on Left Behind series. And I met with, with Mike Hyatt, he came to Atlanta, and I said, you want me to write a book on the Left Behind series? Let me understand this. These bookstores are selling these books like hotcakes. Yeah. Uh, they eventually ended up being like 16 volumes, and you want me to write a book refuting the Left Behind series. Uh, so they're probably make, they might make $4 on my book and probably make tens of thousands of dollars on Left Behind. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, I'll do it, I'll do it. And yeah. I wrote it, uh, End Times Fiction, and I, we, I, when I got the rights back to it, I retitled uh, it uh, Left Behind Separating Fact from Fiction. Okay. And, uh, but it was a, it's a good primer to this, this whole debate. It is, the whole discussion. So, left, so it's called Left Behind, Separating Fact, Fact from, fiction. from Fiction. It's up at American Vision? I think, I think if, it's, if the print version isn't available, I'm, sure, I, I'm pretty sure that the uh, uh, downloadable version would be. If not, I'll make sure it's up in the next couple of days. Okay. So le uh, that book, I think, is like, it's a good primer. It's a good small book that hits a lot of the, the big, the larger issues that really will begin to, I think, uh, I'll, it causes us all to start really probing to say, wait a minute, is what I believe, is it accurate? Did, did, I, did I accept this and believe this because I, I actually saw it in scripture or did I believe it because it's a paradigm that was given to me, you know, via, you know, you know, well-intentioned pastor, teacher, or something right. like that, you know, is, is this where this comes from? Did it come from the Bible itself or did it come from proof texts mm -hmm. that I was fed? throughout my life and it was a really it was a really it was a really encouraging book for me because that was my whole thing was the left behind series the rapture I remember, I remember having debates in Bible college Gary where we were arguing whether we actually had six months or two years left <laughs> that was in 1996 um, and I remember somebody suggested like we had like 10 years or something like that and we all laughed him to scorn like <laughs> You're so ridiculous. <laughs> Ten years. You're so hilarious. They got red heifer. The red heifer. <laughs> I mean, the cornerstone. I remember being at lunch like us, like just just berating this guy. And <laughs> now it's 2019. So. Um, and keep in mind that Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth came out in 1970. Yeah. So what is that? 34. Wow. Was that? Uh, well, almost almost 50 50 years ago. It's a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah almost 50 years ago. 
Of course, he made the – he says he didn't really make a prediction, but everyone knows he did. Right. Uh, that it would all come to an end before 1988 because Israel became a nation again in 1948. Mm -hmm. This generation will not pass away. Mm -hmm. Generation's 40 years. You add 80 – you know, at 40 to 88, you get 2000 – you get 1988. If the rapture takes place seven years before, you've got 1981. Edgar Wisnett came out with a book in 1988, uh, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture's in, in 1988. I debated him. Uh, did you know this? I debated I, him on, on I the radio. Think, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. Do you have a is – it, is this available somewhere? No, no. Oh, I know on. that one isn't. But okay. uh, he said on that show, he says, if I am wrong about this, the Bible is wrong. Oh, goodness. Then, of yeah. course, the next he came out with another. He came out with another book the next was it, year. Was it eighty nine reasons? Eighty nine. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, he had failed to calculate. That's when, hilarious. When you go from BC to to AD, that there's a year that you have to account for. Oh yes, and so he. he and he was a NASA scientist. Yeah. Na NASA oh wow. Engineer. Oh wow! Wow. All right, so let's do this. So let's, I wanted to do a couple discussions today. One, let's talk about the Olivet Discourse, the Great Tribulation. You are very, very helpful. You're a blessing in that area. Then I'm going to talk about the Kingdom of the Messiah. What does the Bible teach us about the Kingdom of the Messiah and the future of the world with the Kingdom of the Messiah? And then maybe just spend just a few moments responding to uh, Brother uh, Albert Moeller's comments on the briefing, where he talked a little bit about postmillennialism, mentioned some things that I think would be we can offer some helpful and loving correction in, in that space. Um, but let's talk about the Great Tribulation. Uh, the Olivet Discourse is in the Synoptics. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Um, and uh, th those three, the, the Synoptics contain the Olivet Discourse, which is the discourse that the Lord Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives when he departs from Jerusalem after condemning the Jewish leadership and uh, confronting them in um, the uh, Gospel of Matthew. Um, and so Jesus departs and it leaves Jerusalem and then is on the Mount of Olives, which is, by the way, the same direction uh, that Yahweh, his glory, leaves the temple in the Old Testament before its destruction in the Old Testament. He departs from there, goes to the east of the Mount of Olives, and then that's the same course Jesus takes after saying that all the blood of the righteous is going to be upon them. Jesus then gives the Olivet Discourse, and this is the famous discourse that is used, um, I mean, universally with the cults and all, all these other religions to, to abuse other human beings, to teach them that the end is near and that, you know, this generation is not going to pass away, and they always refer to their generation. Joseph Smith did this. Um, early Mormon prophets and apostles used uh, the kind of language that's here, the apocalyptics, to say that um, Joseph Smith's generation wasn't going to pass away until Jesus returned in final judgment. It's been done over and yeah, over the, and yeah, over. the Millerites. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, you're right. The Jehovah's Witnesses um, and almost every cult in the 19th century was based uh, upon some apocalyptic concept of the future that right. was going to take place in their particular generation, which became which became easy for them to go and witness to people and bring people into their cult is because they were saying, look, if you don't join with us, you're going to miss this, this eschatological event. You're going to go to hell. Yeah. And so that was one of their recruiting devices. And people still use it today. And they'll say something to the effect, well, we're leading people to Christ with this. Uh, you know, people, they don't say this, that people are going to get scared and they'll come into the kingdom. But then after a while, as people start reading the Bible, they, things just don't seem to fit with that. And that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then they start questioning not only the Olivet Discourse, but if Jesus was wrong about that, then what else was he wrong about? And they end up leaving the faith. Bart Ehrman is a perfect example he is, of yeah. that. Yes. That's what happened to him. Mm. Yes. So, so in terms of the importance of this section, I'll just say quickly, um, you just mentioned it. Gary just mentioned the importance of this, is that this, this section of Scripture, the Olivet Discourse, if we don't interpret it biblically in its context faithfully, if we, put it, if we impose a paradigm upon it, well, then what are the consequences? Well, I would say, A, uh, people will, I think, rightly say, based upon bibl the biblical standards that are given to us, Matthew, sorry, Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, if you have a false prophecy, mm -hmm. you're a false prophet. Well, I mean, people like Ehrman and Christopher Hitchens will look at that, and it's a chestnut argument for atheists, where they'll say, well, right. look, Jesus gave a false prophecy. Yep, exactly. He said to them, those disciples, not to some other disciples, to those disciples, that their generation wouldn't pass away until what? All, all, not some, all these things take place. So atheists will use this well, to... Christopher Hitchens did it uh, in 
Yep. Collision. Collision. Yep. Yes, he did. Uh, with with uh, Douglas Wilson at Westminster Seminary. That's brought right. up that very issue. That's right. And uh, I've always said that if it had been a dispensationalist who was answering Hitchens, they'd still be there. That's right. Trying to figure out what this means. But it took Douglas Wilson. 60 seconds. Yeah. It, you, know, it, it, you know, maybe a little longer than that. And I would talk to Darren, Darren Doan, who was the, the producer and director of, of it, and he said you could hear a pin drop because these were Westminster Seminary students who hadn't heard the apologetic mm. that Jesus was referring to that particular generation and that particular generation alone. Yes, that's right. So people will um, abandon the faith. Um, obviously, we know that if you know they went out from us, they were never really yeah. of us, but they'll abandon the faith, their profession of faith, because they'll see... In a text like this, no, Jesus did say to those disciples that their generation would experience and see all these things uh, before they all had passed away. And atheists use this as a chestnut argument. Um, but also, I think just generally speaking, God calls us to be faithful with his word. And I think all of us, we need to come to a text like this and interpret it in light of the biblical narrative, the whole story of the Bible. This isn't a one-off moment for the Lord Jesus where he comes in and starts tossing out some stuff that was like never anticipated, never expected. This is the, the Old Testament story actually unfolding their promises in the Old Testament of, of judgment and salvation with the coming of the Messiah. And here is Jesus now in that story, uh, promising those covenant breakers the judgment mm. that was anticipated. In fact, if you, in Matthew's gospel, if you start reading it, you, you begin to see that the Olivet Discourse actually begins with chapter 21. That's right. Because Jesus is, the, is at the Mount of Olives, and everything from chapters 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25 it is a unit, and when you when you see the whole thing, and then Jesus lays out this indictment upon that generation, it just doesn't begin with Matthew 24, 23, 36 and Matthew twenty four thirty four, uh, because the the, um, the his his audience in Matthew twenty three, I guess it's twenty one, um, verse forty five says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables. They understood that he was speaking about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when they sought to seize him, they became afraid of the multitudes because they, uh, they held him to be a prophet. So, look, they understood he meant their generation. Jesus, why didn't Jesus say, well, no, no, I'm not talking about you. This is something that's going to take place in a way distant future. And that would have, that would have you know, saved a, an argument. But right. he, Jesus was talking about that. They knew, they knew exactly who he was talking to. That's right. And so Jesus, you're exactly right, and an apology at church, that's exactly what I've done from 21 through 24, where we're at thus far, is shown that it is a complete unit here. Jesus, you have to take this, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. He comes and he has the second cleansing of the temple, and which was in the law of God. That's what the priest would have to do. Come right. First cleanse the come check the house, come back to see if there's disease and take it apart stone off a of stone. There's a lot there that's happening. And so uh, Jesus comes, cleanses the temple, comes out, curses the fig tree. It's a figure, it's, it's Israel and no fruit's gonna come from you again. And then comes this, this constant indictment upon those covenant breakers where Jesus is talking about them. They know he's talking about them. They even say it, they're getting angry because they know right. it's them. And so Jesus then has the epic moment where he uses the serrated edge against the religious leadership of Jerusalem, where he calls them brood of vipers and all the rest. And this is where we get to 20, I'd like you to tell, help us through here, 23, where Jesus says that all the blood of the righteous will be upon that generation. And he says, truly I say to you, verse tw uh, 36 of 23, he says, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, Gary, just help us with this. You've talked about this a lot in your books, but this is a big help to me. When I was in Bible college, there were ways, I remember being in, in eschatology class and my professor um i won't mention his name he was a good man um he was telling us that ganea the the word there would refer to like the probably the jewish race or jewish people um but what does it what does the word mean when it's used throughout the uh, the gospels in the new testament well what i do is i take people back to matthew chapter one okay everyone talks about the you know the first use of a word it's it's significant I, that's not always the case because uh, there are there are obviously multiple uh, ways a word can be used, but Greek is a lot more precise than our English English mm. language. Uh, but look at Matthew chapter one verse seventeen, where the same Greek word is used in Matthew uh, one seventeen. You'll find in Matthew twenty three thirty six and Matthew twenty four thirty four and lots of other places. Matthew probably I think probably uses uh, Ganea uh, more than anyone does chapters eleven and twelve and and, and elsewhere. But therefore, all the generations from Abraham to David 
uh, are 14 generations, and from David to the de deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, from the deportation to Babylon to the time of Christ, 14 generations. And Schofield reference Bible, and a lot of even translations today, I'm using the New American Standard, and they'll put in the margin, and it'll say, they'll, they put generation in the text, and they say, or race. It makes absolutely no sense. If you, if you were to plug in race in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, you end up with, therefore, all the races from Abraham to David are 14 races, and from David mm. to the deportation to Babylon, 14 races, and from the um, deporting of Babylon to the time of Christ, 14 races. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. No. Um, Ghania means uh, people born and living at a particular period of time. Right. And there's no other generation, there's no other definition you can give it. Uh, it's so clear in all the Gospels, it is amazing to me to find uh, scholars trying to get around it. Right. And I think, I think we've won that battle. Uh, very few people today would would try to say it means race. So they so they moved they moved to to st stage two, um, and stage two is well it must mean the generation that sees these signs will not pass away until all these things take place. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get that you have to get rid of the word this, add the word the the yeah. generation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then add that sees these signs. Mm -hmm. um, there's the example of, of having a paradigm, an idea outside, not letting the text simply speak and having to say, well, it, let's impose this idea or these mm. words on the text yeah. to I, make it fit our paradigm. I've been listening to a series of uh, talks that Greg Bonson uh, did uh, for one of our conferences. This was done in 1992, and it's a just wonderful thing on Christian apologetics. And I think it's the, it's either the, I think it's the fourth lecture, and he's dealing with this very topic of Facts are always interpreted facts. People have underlying assumptions. And when you present them with an argument, two, one of two things happens. Uh, they, were, they will uh, reassess their position and change their presuppositions. Or they'll hold on to their, their position and then they will create a new paradigm in order to make it fit the facts mm. as they see them. Yes. And so that's mm. what's happened here. And what you, you know, the generation that sees these signs. Well, all you have to do is look at verse 33. So this is right before verse 34. It says, even so you too, when you, audience reference here, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Mm -hmm. So we're told what audience is being addressed here. Yes. It's them right. yes. when you see these things. Now this is, so it can't mean race of people. It can't, it can't mean that generation that sees these signs because... You have, to, you have to take away a, a significant word, the near demonstrative this, and then add words in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. And we're always critical of cults for doing that. Jehovah's <laughs> Witnesses, if you go to Colossians 1, they're talking about Jesus as, as uh, you know, he was before all things, mm -hmm. and they put in brackets he, before all, all other, other things. things. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, what we accuse the cults of, you know, here we've got people we're doing, doing that. Yeah. yeah. Then yeah. someone else said, well, it's really... This nation will not pass away. Well, there's a perfectly good word for the word nation. It's up in verse 14, ethnos. We get the word ethnic out of it. And then the logic doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, if you see this race, uh, the, which they mean the Jewish race. So it says the Jewish race will not pass away until all these things take place. When all these things take place, the Jewish race passes away. Yeah. But the whole dispensational system is about the permanence of the of the of, of the Jewish race yeah so no matter which way you go with this the, the the biblical interpretation is it's referring to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking right and you're not left with another option no that's it and we shouldn't want one and right. I think I think the important thing here is if somebody's if somebody's opening up right now listening to this saying okay I'm open now I'll listen to what you're saying and I'm gonna I'm gonna assess my presuppositions what I want to encourage them to see is that if you take this as it stands and as it's stated that generation and jesus is actually speaking to them about things that are going to happen to them guess what you get you get the vindication of the messiah exactly that all these things did happen exactly as jesus said on time as promised and um it, it vindicates christ as the messiah as the promised messiah so it's a good thing to say let it speak 
as it's as it is and let it let, let the text actually um guide you into showing you that this generation means that generation mm-hmm. and it took place on time and as planned so that you can see that jesus is the promised messiah oh, exactly That's the point. So, yeah you can believe him on this yeah and you can believe him on anything that's and right this also helps you go to second peter chapter three and people talk about oh you're just scoffing you know people uh saying well jesus is not coming back in our day and so forth and so on and um and then Second Peter chapter 3, G, uh, Peter writes, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And people say, See, you're a scoffer because Jesus made this prediction and you're scoffing about his coming. But what Peter is dealing with here is that generation was about to pass away. Uh, the last days is not the la- our last days, but the last days of the old mm, covenant the old order covenant is about, about to pass away. That's right. And these people were mocking Jesus' prophecy that he would come before their generation passed away. Because here we were probably maybe mid-60s, mm-hmm. temple still standing. In fact, the temple is standing like it had never stood before. I mean, this is the, this is the rebuilt temple that the Old Testament talks about. Mm-hmm. This is Herod's temple, and it's my understanding and reading about history that this was a glorious, glorious uh, edifice. Uh, in fact, Jesus makes, makes uh, that point, I think, in, in Mark and Luke's gospel. I mean, look, and the disciples point out and said, look at this, look at this grand temple here. Right. That's what they were mocking. You, he said this temple was going to be destroyed before our generation passed away. And look at it, how can you say that? Well, within a few years it was, and not one stone was left upon another. It was burned, it was burned down. Mm-hmm. Um, and today you go to Israel, there's no indication that that temple ever, ever existed. That's right. That's right. And uh-huh. I, I think what's interesting, too, to point out, and this was, I think, devastating to my own thinking on, on this issue uh, based upon what I had believed and been taught before, was that Jesus actually says here in 2337, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers mm. a brood under her wings, and you were not willing. He says, uh, and so he, he t- tells them about the coming destruction, but what's interesting here is he's speaking about Jerusalem, and then as you get a little bit into the discourse here, where he's talking about the Great Tribulation, he says in verse 15 and 24, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So this is obviously a local judgment that can be escaped. Exactly, on um, foot. On foot, on foot. Um, yeah. It's interesting because if you actually compare this to Luke uh, 21. Luke gives a little more Gentile language here. He helps to sort of express what this is. Instead of saying the abomination of desolation, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee. And what's interesting, too, is that the early Christians did. They did, yes. They wrote, Tell us about that. Well, there was the, the, the Roman army had, in fact, surrounded mm-hmm. Jerusalem, and no one knows why, but they dispersed uh, f- for whatever reason, which mm-hmm. then opened up a gateway out of the city yeah and uh, there were unfortunately there were a lot of people uh, within the city who thought that they were going to be rescued by the Messiah right mm-hmm. and it, it you know it never it never came uh, and this is another interesting point the modern the modern day theory about the Great Tribulation uh, you know the rapture takes place you know, Christians are supposed to be taken off the earth and then there's seven year period which is Daniel's 70th week that's a whole nother topic but during that period we're, we're told by the dispensationalists that two-thirds of the Jews living in Israel are going to be slaughtered uh, based upon uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 8. Yeah. Um, and think about that. So this is another Holocaust. Now, this isn't, this isn't my assessment of their view. Mm-hmm. This is their view, and I've got all the quotations from them, from, from you know, uh, Hal Lindsey and John Walvoord and... Uh, all kinds of people about this particular position and yet these you know same christians today are excited because they see here these that jews are returning to israel Mm -hmm. and yet if they really believe this they would be telling them to get out of israel jesus did jesus told him to leave the city Mm -hmm. flee to the mountains Mm -hmm. Uh, jesus gave them 40 years uh, to Mm -hmm. make this decision as to who they wanted to align with Mm -hmm. To repent, uh, yeah. But today, it's 
you know, the, you know it, it, the Jews are moving to Israel, and that's great. Let's go visit Israel. But they're the same people who are saying two-thirds of the Jews are going to be slaughtered during the Great Tribulation. That's right. So, that's a good point. Well, yeah, very good point. And, and definitely piques your curiosity in terms of the perspective that you bring to this. But if you, if you look at the text there, the, the Lord Jesus is actually telling people how they can escape this local judgment, flee to the mountains. The early Christians actually did. After the Roman armies backed away, the Christians actually fled. And history, I think it was Eusebius that said they went to a town called Pella. Um, so they did escape. They didn't go back to get their coat. They didn't go back to go there. Jesus is warning them, when you see this, don't waste time going back to grab your stuff. Yeah, and th- by the way, this is an indication that this is a this is a, a, a an ancient culture here. Yeah. You got flat roofs. I was, we go up on our roof just to, you know, to <laughs> check for a, a leak. Yeah. We don't go up there now to you live and so forth. You don't want to go to any roofs in Arizona. No, Trust how, me. How, how big's your cl- I know how big our closet is and how many cloaks my wife might have. <laughs> uh, that's not talking about right. this. Yeah. Uh, Sabbath day regulations were still in operation. Yeah. Uh, and again, you could you could escape this by just fleeing to the mountain. Uh, that's right. On, on foot. And by the way, that little statement in there about, you know, uh, being with child during this period of time, because there is this incident that's um, incident that Josephus talks about. Uh, this you know starvation had taken place. Talk about that. Yeah, that's okay. important. There's a woman. I think her name was Maria. There's a, a, a woman. Well, the, these Roman soldiers come in. This is this is after all this devastation has taken place, and she, they smell something cooking, and it was a woman who had actually. I don't know if the child had died. Uh, and or she had killed her child, but she needed something to eat, right. and she cooked, cooked her child. Yeah, and th- I mean these are these were hardened Romans, and they were affected by mm-hmm. it all. Yeah, and we last night we talked a little bit about a, a strange, strange Bible verse uh, that commentators don't seem to mm-hmm. be able to figure out. We have a mutual friend, Jim Jordan, yeah. who seems to be able to figure out all these passages. That there's a verse that says, "You do not." boil a kid in his mother's milk Mm -hmm. and now the jews have taken that you don't mix meat and dairy together which if that's all it means it's strange kind of strange (laughs) yeah and jim says this is a an indication of what god's rebels do with his offspring and so jesus is the kid he's the lamb he's the lamb of god takes away the sins of the world and they they murder him they boil him in their mother's milk, Jerusalem be, mm-hmm. being, in fact, the mother. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Which is, he's, it's referred to as the mother. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, yeah. and so yeah. all, all of this symbolism fits, all this yeah. fits together and makes much, much more sense uh, in terms of the generation whom Jesus is speaking. Yeah. Right. And so people struggle, though, uh, Gary, this is what they struggle with. And just to do, just do a burst on this. Um, they'll struggle because Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumors, rumors of wars. wars. Now, I, I when I first discovered this, I was blown away because I thought, well, yeah, that's so funny. Because if, if, if a prophet came in the room today and said, hey, guys, I'm the Messiah, and I'm going to give you some predictions about the future today, 2019, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. We would be like so unimpressive. Right. It, w- so, so very unimpressive. But why was it impressive for Jesus to say there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Well, I, I, personally, I think what Jesus is saying here, those really aren't significant signs. The, si- the real signs don't occur till later. Okay. Uh, I think what Jesus is saying here is, you know, you're going to be hearing of these types of things. They're not the types of signs you need to be looking for. There's a much more significant sign going on here. But yeah. there were wars and rumors of wars. The Roman Empire was an empire of compulsion. Uh, it was, I mean, Israel was under the heel of Rome, and every, so, was every, so was Egypt and Syria and the rest of them. Uh, there were constant wars going on uh, during that particular period of time. Uh, this takes place during, excuse me, during the, the, so, uh, the Pax Romana. It's supposed to be a period of peace, but it wasn't. There were wars taking place all over the place. Mm-hmm. The same thing with earthquakes. It doesn't say that there will be bigger there'll be more earthquakes and bigger earthquakes. It just says there'll be earthquakes in various places. And there were earthquakes in various places. Mm -hmm. The time of Jesus' crucifixion, there was an earthquake. Time of Jesus' resurrection, there was an earthquake. In the book of Acts, earthquake, history of the period, earthquakes. Uh, Acts 11 talks about famines. 
There was a famine throughout the whole Oikumene, the whole Roman Empire. Yep. Uh, this is the, you don't you don't have to even go outside to the history books. The Bible itself explains all these things. Everything Jesus said, they understood. Refer to their generation and no other generation. In other words, you can see it in the New Testament unfolding. Yeah, it's exactly. right there in the pages of the New Testament. Yeah. You don't have to go outside to find it. Right. Okay. Um, now let's get to some of the stuff. Well, let's do this. I'm gonna. We're gonna take a quick mer- commercial break here, guys. Let everyone get a chance to use the bathroom. Do what you got to do. Just make sure you share the episode. Let everyone know. When we come back, I am gonna ask the challenging question that everyone's going yes, but let me show you the complete failure of this perspective, and that's about stars falling from the heavens and the signs in the heavens and those sorts of things. Because you see, here's the deal. Look, no stars hit the earth um, in the the first century, Gary. So clearly you are wrong. Um, we're talking about blood moons and all the rest. Clearly, this this perspective, it just can't cut the mu- It doesn't work. It will not actually fit. And so I'm going to encourage you guys to stick with us, and we're going to find out, did the stars fall from the heavens in the first century? My answer is, biblically speaking, absolutely without question. So stay with us, guys. Be right back. ApologiaStudios.com is where you guys go to get more content here with Gary DeMar, the bear, the girl. When we come back, we're also going to see this. See this? When we come back, we're also going to do our drawing for all the early birders. Yeah, yeah. Everyone who is early bird for ReformCon, our conference, the 24th through the 26th of October, ReformCon.org. ReformCon.org. Um, everyone who is early bird got put into a uh, drawing here where we're going to take you out to dinner. Uh, so stay with us, guys. See if your name comes up. We'll be right back right here at ApologiaStudios.com. Hey, no, no, no. for New St. Andrews College, as it trains its students, is not to make people who will be able to go out and just get jobs, people who will just be bricks in the wall of our society. The goal for New St. Andrews College is to make students into men and women who will really impact culture. I want their faith to not just be something that stands, but something around which culture can be built. We want students who can um, think critically about arguments, but also about the culture around them, that can then speak clearly to it, and that also have the ability to influence and shape because of the power of their message. Because that's really what the gospel does. The gospel throws down all the arguments against it. It speaks to the hearts of people, it influences, and it changes.
to ApologiaStudios.com, get signed up, partner with us in all access. You get all of the radio programs, you get the TV show, you get the after show, including Apologia Academy, and you partner with us in ministry, bringing the gospel around the world. All right, guys, welcome back to Apologia Radio. Thank you guys for joining us. So glad you guys are here. All right, uh, so we are on talking with Gary DeMar with American Vision. You guys can get more from Gary at AmericanVision.org or .com. There's the store there. You guys encourage you to pick up some books, get some articles, get some audio. Excellent, excellent place to hang out and just get a lot of really great help. Um, we're talking right now about the Great Tribulation, the Olivet Discourse. We're talking about um, end times stuff. We were talking about the Olivet Discourse a moment ago before break, and we were talking about whether or not we have a basis to believe that the Lord Jesus meant what he said and that that generation will not pass away until all those things took place. Um, did these things take place on time and as planned? We talked about the fact that Jesus promised them that all these things would be upon that generation, that it was going to be a local judgment. They could escape by foot um, when Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee to the mountains. They were told... Um, uh, things about the Sabbath. So that's still going on in that day. We're talking about rooftops. We're talking about things that were going to occur in their generation. And those are all literal things we're talking about. And they're about. all literal things. It was interesting. I did see someone in the comments that was like, I'd love to have, I'd love to, 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 to talk to Jeff about this as a literalist. Well, I'm, as, I'm asking the question. Yeah, the wars, the wars are literal. Who's the famines the, are literal. The earthquakes are literal. The yeah. temple is literal. Yeah. Uh, the abomination that causes desolation, that's literal. Right. Mm. Everything we've talked about so far is literal. I like to use the word physical rather than literal. Because yeah, literal physical. simply means according to the literature. Right. These are all things <laughs> that Jesus specific. False prophets were literal. First John chapter 4, verse 1. Yep. There were first false prophets. Peter as well, false prophets and false teachers. Everything, everything we've talked about all the way through here so mm -hmm. far right. has been literal. Literal. This generation. Literal. literal. Yep. All these things. Yep. Literal. Literal. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't know what he's talking about. Now, when we get to this next passage, yeah. which you, why don't you introduce? We that. want to do it biblically, right? right? So let me, let's 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 give some context here. When we talk about how God speaks in the Old Testament over and over and over again, God uses a particular type of language when He was talking about judgment. Judgment is coming. Um, he uses a lot of symbolism. Now, a lot of Christians today, maybe uh, they call themselves literalists, uh, but they really aren't because they don't believe that God is always speaking, quote, literally. For example, when God calls his wife a whore uh, and harlot in the Old Testament and uh, it refers to her as a prostitute, he says he puts a ring in her nose and he makes her beautiful and all these things, and she's uh, spreading her legs by the road to every passerby, all these things. Is that literal? Like literal? Or is God using an image there to describe something? Right. Or when Jesus calls himself the door, literally, with mm -hmm. hinges, or when our God's a consuming fire. Believe that you literally? Eat his body and drink his blood. Eat his body and drink his blood. Really? Literally? Like, are we, are, we, are we holding consistently to that? The answer is no Christian does. Like, for example, no Christian goes to the book of Revelation and says, that's all full-on literal, uh, 100% right we've got a, a whore riding a seven-headed ten-horned beast right drinking blood of the of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus like that's literal a really a woman we're supposed to look for in the future that has Babylon written literally on her forehead and she's drinking blood and she's riding this crazy seven-headed ten-horned beast <laughs> how about literally like um, man hoppers like locusts with men's faces like we got man hoppers like we're looking for in the future nobody does it quote literally the question is not literal versus figurative but it's really uh whether you're going to question where you're actually going to uh, interpret the bible biblically biblically let the bible actually mm -hmm. do the interpreting and right. the defining of things so gary bring us into that discussion about apoc apocalyptic language that are thinking help help us with the stars falling from the heavens. Uh, there's a really there's a very good commentary by a really good commentator D. A. Carson's wrote an excellent commentary on the Book of Matthew in the Expositor, Expositor's Bible Commentary series, and he's everything everything you and I have said all the way up to this point. I think up to verse 28, he says took place before that generation passed away. Yeah. Now if verse 34 says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. You can't stop at verse 28 because these things that follow, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33, are before verse 34. And so he then projects, and he doesn't, he's not the only one, he projects the sun, moon, and stars language to the, to the distant future. 
And uh, it, the problem with that view is, if you go all the way up through verse 28, and that refers to the destruction of Jerusalem before their generation passed away, verse 29 says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after. Immediately. Uh, so if we're going to be literal again, this God can't be, immediately after can't be 2,000 years. Right. So, so people get hung up on this language that comes next. And I have a, a friend that other people would know who he was, uh, who was very into the left behind stuff. Mm. And um, he, he, someone had given him a video series on this very topic. And he, he was going through, put, he would put one disc in after another, says, you know, well, it, that makes sense, that makes sense. But there is no way that Gary DeMar can convince me that verse 29 took place before that generation passed away. And I think that's a, that's a, healthy, that's a healthy view. Right. Uh, you have to be a Berean, search the scriptures daily mm. to see whether these things are so. Well, what, who's, where's Jesus getting that language? But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Well, it comes right out of the Old Testament. That's right. It, it's, it's a description of Babylon yeah. and, and, and um, Isaiah chapter 13. Can, can I read it? Sure. Yeah. So Isaiah 13, it's, uh, so I'll start in verse uh, 9. Um, and uh, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the, of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. This is a judgment against Babylon. Exactly. And you will find the similar language in uh, Ezekiel 32. You'll find it in Isaiah chapter 34. In fact, it's all over the Old Testament prophets that when Jesus is describing the coming judgment of a nation, he talks about the sun being darkened, the moon being darkened as well, obviously, and stars, and stars falling from the heavens. In fact, if you go to... Um, Revelation chapter six, I think it says a third of the stars fall, you know, fall to earth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is chapter six. A third of the stars fall to earth in Revelation six. If one star even came close to earth, the sun, yeah, we would be, <laughs> we would be destroyed. But yeah. if a third of them fall yeah. to earth, that's a and, lot. And, and now we've got, we've got chapter seven through twenty-two still to take place. Right, that take place on earth. We're supposed to get the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to, you know, have a mm. chips put in our hands. Wait a minute, the earth was just destroyed by a third of the stars falling to earth. Yeah, this is language that's typical of the Old Testament. I'm not making up this this stuff. It's all in the Old Testament. Jesus quotes it and applies it to Babylon. And two other things. It's interesting that Israel is described as sun, moon, and stars in um, Genesis chapter 37. Yep. Uh, you know, the dream, uh, Joseph has this dream of the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him. His That's right. father, his mother, and his 11, 11 brothers. Sun, moon, and stars. Sun, moon, and stars. Revelation chapter 12, there's a, a woman. You want to take this, let's take this literally, literally. There's a, that means there's a giant woman out in space. She's got to be a giant because she can. she's standing on the moon. She has to be fireproof because she's got the sun wrapped around her as a, as a cloak. And then she's got to be pretty st strong because she's got a crown of 12 stars. Yeah. You know, and she gives birth to a child. Come on. Yeah. It's a symbolic representation That's right. of of Israel or God's people or whatever the case might be. That's right. Yes. That's hilarious. So the point is, is that Jesus describes judgment that's going to fall on that generation, those covenant breakers. He promises it to them. Again, read from Matthew 21 all the way through 24, and you're going to see that there's a particular context for that generation. And the interesting thing here is that he takes language that they knew and understood, say from Isaiah 13, that was used against a pagan nation of God's judgment that was going to fall on them, and it did. Ever met, meet any Babylonians today? You got any any followers of Nebuchadnezzar? Like oh, around? The, uh, uh, hey, don't make fun of that because there are a lot of people. I just I just did a, a very short review of a book uh, uh, by um, uh, Ron Rhodes on the New Babylon. Right. That literal Babylon right. is going to be brought back. From the dead. From the you know dead yeah, because yeah. it's it that's that's what it's that's what it says. Right. Uh, and now the, the better case might be 
uh, and it was interesting. And he wrote in that, in that book that uh, Babylon is used, I think he said 44 times in the book of Revelation, and there are 400 and some verses. So I think he said there's, it's like Babylon is used 11 times, mm -hmm. and that was significant. And I made, the, I made the point, I said, chapters 4 through 19 are supposed to be about Israel. Because the, remember, the church is raptured, Revelation chap, chapter 4, verse 1. That's what the dispensationalists say. And then the rest of it is Israel. God's going to deal with Israel again. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times the word Israel appears from chapters 4 through 19? How many times does the word Israel appear? Zero. Close. One time. One? One time. Okay. But Babylon appears 44 times, but the, from chapter 4 through 19, it's supposed to be all about Israel. So the question is, huh. who's Babylon? That's right, who is Babylon? I believe ba Babylon is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, first century Jerusalem. It's the great city. It was yes. described in, in 11. Yeah. So it's Sodom, Egypt, mm -hmm. where, the, where the Lord was crucified, the That's great right. city. The great city. It's Babylon. Every time it's yeah. Jerusalem. So yes. it is about Israel. Chapters 4 through 19 are about yeah, Israel. The harlot. And it's the harlot. The, mm -hmm. she, he's, the harlot is dressed like the priest, all the garments of the priest. It's, yeah. it's self per Persecuting the saints, oh, exactly. like, Je like Jesus said that right. they were going to do, yeah. exactly like he said he was gonna, they were going to do. So the point is, is that Matthew 24 has a particular context. Jesus promises to that generation their judgment, and now is using language that the Jews understood was language God used as judgment language um, against a pagan nation, and Jesus now uses it in their context, upon their city, Jerusalem, and that generation. And so we have the same kind of judgment language that Yahweh uses in the Old Testament. Now Yahweh in the flesh is using it against first century Jerusalem, and all of it occurred. And this was devastating for me. Devastating. I'll just throw it out quickly. Devastating was that in Matthew 24, when you let the text just speak, all these things did take place. But Jesus actually goes on about no one knows a day and hour. And Jesus actually tells them that there's going to be people eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage to the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood swept them all away. So will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Then Jesus actually tells us about the two men in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. Now, we even had when the Left Behind series came out, the Left Behind series, not, no, the Left Behind movie came out. All of the massive marketing, mass marketing that went across social media, I saw thousands of shares. It's a guy in a field and he's holding something in his hand and he's obviously left, right? And it's like left behind. And in, in the series of left behind the books and the move me, a movie, those who are left behind are the unbelievers. The unsaved are left right. behind. I remember being a Bible college and this particular text about the field and the mill, one is taken, one is left. I was thinking rapture, secret rapture. That's how this is used. Right. But if you let the text speak and stop imposing paradigms on it, Jesus gives you an anchor. He says, as in the days of Noah, two are there, one is taken, one is left. Who is swept away? Exactly. Mm -hmm. In Noah's day, it's the wicked right. who are swept away, and it's the righteous who are left. Who are left. left behind. It is literally reverse. Yeah. If you take the text and let it speak, it is literally the reverse of what we impose upon it as Christians. In this text, it is the wicked who are swept away and the righteous who are left behind. In our day, we're saying that it's the righteous who are taken away and the wicked who are left behind. But that goes against the entire perspective of Scripture and even what we're to pray about, where Jesus is even telling us it's the meek that inherit the earth. It's praying for God's will to take place on earth as it is in heaven. See, I would say that the Old and New Testament actually gives us a very different perspective of the future, and that's that the kingdom of the Messiah actually, through the gospel, through the salvation of God, actually has victory over the entire world, and it's the righteous who inherit the earth, the meek inherit the earth. Very different perspective, and I don't believe that this text here is talking about a secret rapture, uh, because in Noah's day, it was the righteous who were left behind. I've even seen some uh, dispensationalist writers uh, kind of correct the older paradigm about this being a rapture. They, yeah. they do attribute it to the Romans coming in hmm. and literally taking, I mean, they, they've killed him, of course, but many of them were taken into 
into slavery, there's a, um, I guess in Rome, there's a depiction of the Jews carrying in elements of the temple uh, in, in, into, into Rome, out, out, of, out of Jerusalem. And uh, there are some that even speculate that the Jews helped in the building of the Colosseum because mm-hmm. uh, they were taken as they were taken as slaves. Yeah, but that passage has nothing to do with a secret rapture. It deals That's with right. it's a judgment phrase, not on God's people, uh, but on the, the those who rejected Jesus's threat and promise and warning that these things would take place before the generation passed away. That's right. That's right. So just a, a quick go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say in regards to that I'm glad we're having this discussion because there's apparently a lot of people watching live that aren't listening to a word we're saying. And <laughs> but they first Thessalonians four keeps coming up with a secret secret rapture and everything they're basing all of their theology off of that right. passage. Yeah. So while we're talking about that, can you kind of maybe Break that down real quick for First those that should be listening. Yeah, there's a number of interpretations. I'll give you the classic interpretation of First Thessalonians four that this has been this is the general resurrection. Mm. It means it, it's sometime in the distant future Jesus will return, the dead in Christ, and those who are alive will be ra- will be raised up and meet with Jesus. You'll be with him forever. That's what that passage has always meant, but that's not the what that's not how that passage is used today. That passage is used as a as a, a passage. Uh, of a, of escape of called something called a rapture that takes place of one of five rapture positions by the way not one the general resurrection there's this everybody <laughs> believes that Jesus will come again to judge the quick and the dead mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's generally how that passage has been dealt with uh, then the secret rapture idea comes along in the 19th century and says no 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 this is there's another event that comes before this and then followed by a thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth First Thessalonians 4 doesn't say anything about it. Right. And I challenge everybody who's listening to this right now, read the passage yourself. It has nothing to do with the church being taken off the earth and mm-hmm. then during a seven-year tribulation period. It says nothing about a thousand years to follow. It says nothing about an antichrist. It says nothing about an antichrist making a covenant with the Jews uh, for three and a half years and then breaking it in the middle of the seven years and that, et cetera. None of that is in there. Right. Uh, this passage has always been used as a, a depiction of what happens when Jesus returns at the end of history. Right. The rapture isn't the return of Jesus at the end of history. It's supposedly a secret rapture where Jesus returns and then the church is taken off the earth. I challenge anybody to find that in that passage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's not there. Yeah. Also, I Excellent. think it's important for us that if we are in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse and the Synoptics, it's not proper biblical, methodo- biblical methodology of exegesis to be in the midst of one text right. and to say, well, because of what I believe about this proof text over here, those texts can't be saying that. Right. That means you have a paradigm. That means you have a presupposition mm. uh, through which you're interpreting the rest of the Bible. The question is, is that presupposition right? Is it accurate? Is it biblical? We, that's what we're challenging. All right, so Gary, let's get into just a quick big, a quick sort of big uh, issue, but give me a burst on it. I think it's I think it's easy to do in terms of people go from here and they say, oh my goodness, Gary, you just took away from me what I thought was my hope for the future, right? Well, Gary, what is the hope for the future according to the Old and New Testament? Give us a burst on that. What is the actual perspective held by Christians throughout 2,000 years of church history, giants of the faith that believed what about the future? Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm always amazed when people say you took, took my hope away. Uh, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what happened to the, the, the all, every Christian who's died from the time of Christ up to today for almost 2,000 years? What, what are they waiting for? Yeah. You're, you're waiting for a rapture. Well, they didn't experience this rapture. They died. Right. Uh, you're, I'm, you know, I hate to, I hate to break this to you, but you're more likely than not to die. Now, what, what is your hope? Yep. Your hope is in the, the Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, we follow him in our death and resurrection. That's right. And we reign, we, we reign with, with Christ. That's right. That's your hope. Mm-hmm. That's always been the biblical hope. The rapture is a, a let me get this make this clear the rapture idea is a 19th century yeah. invention yep. yep which means that anything before the 19th century you have to maintain that these people were just completely wrong about all of this which i guess it's it's possible that they were completely wrong about it all but then you have to say that those people didn't have any hope 
They did have hope. Mm-hmm. Abraham, you read, all you have to do is read the book of, 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 of Hebrews. Uh, Abraham, Jesus said, you know, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He didn't say, I heard about the rapture and was, was glad. Mm-hmm. He said, I see, saw my day, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the seeing of Jesus at, at, at the, his Father's right hand, Jesus reigning from heaven, having all authority in heaven and earth, and that when you die, you're going to be with Christ in heaven. That's your hope. It's This idea that the rapture somehow takes your hope away is, yeah. is, mm-hmm. is mystifying to me. Yeah, yeah. So um, Christians have believed throughout church history that Christ is ruling and reigning on his throne now. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's on the Messianic throne now. When Jesus ascended, he said all authority, not some. He's not waiting to get any. He says all authority in heaven and where? Here, on this earth, right now. This is past tense, by the way. Has been given to me, Jesus says, so therefore go, because it's all mine, and go make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Mm -hmm. I've commanded you. So Jesus already told us that he's got the Messianic power and authority now. All of it. Now, I know that some people will say, um, well, you see, Jeff, it's a now but not yet yeah. serious situation. But what the real, here's the thing. Like, be honest. Please be honest. Because I, I was there, too. I'll, I'll confess it. I, I, I was doing this. When you say now but not yet with Jesus' messiahship and his kingdom, what you mean is now but not really. I mean, yeah. That's what we're really saying. Right. Because um, what we're saying is that he meant it. Literally. Like he meant it. He has all authority in heaven and on earth now. And then he's occupying now that right hand of the Father, that messianic authority and throne, now ruling and reigning. And now he's advancing his rule, his reign and his authority and his salvation is extending to the end of the earth. And every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is being brought now to the Lord Jesus. How? Not through military might and political mm-hmm. might, but through the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. The message of salvation goes out. People are redeemed. You were just mentioning, actually, while we were having lunch together, you're mentioning that you have dual citizenship. You are an Italian, and you have you have two two oh, dual, I missed dual that citizenship. Discussion. Yeah, it's kind of cool actually. Yeah. So if you think about it, your your own background in history is 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 one line. Um, mine is completely different, and um, we're all descended from pagans, essentially parents, most of us, like somewhere down our line, pagans, right? Um, we've got these different backgrounds, and, and, and you've got an, even a normal weekend at apology at church right now, and on a Sunday, you'll have black people, you'll have white people, you'll have red people, you'll have yellow people, you have every color is represented, everyone is there, and all of us are worshiping and loving the Lord God of Israel because of the Messiah Jesus in the middle of the stinking desert in Arizona. Arizona, right? And on the other side of the world. So when someone says to me, I don't see how you mean the kingdom of Jesus is spreading throughout the world and all the nations are coming. Oh, you haven't heard about what's happening in China right now? You haven't seen the video of them with their cell phones out singing, um, what is it again? The song they're singing, the Chinese are I'm singing? Not sure as they're, it's like their an- the anthem of the movement Hallelu- is like hallelujah to the Lord in China. China's on track to be the most Christian nation in like 10 years or something like that. It's crazy. What do you mean Jesus isn't ruling and reigning and, and look, on this And throne? I think one of the reasons we're seeing such an onslaught of evil in the world today, it was the same time when Jesus came. Satan is loosed. He comes out of wherever he was hiding, and he saw he had to he had to get rid of this Jesus. He tried it with Herod, tried it with the Pharisees, tried it with um, uh, uh, Pontius Pilate. Yeah. Uh, Jesus is is you know we think of the head crushing in the Bible, and Satan thinks he had him right at the very end, and that stake of the cross came right on down in his skull, and it 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 was a shout of victory for for Jesus and everything that he claimed to do. Yeah. Uh, we're, I think that one of the reasons we're seeing that, seeing the onslaught of oppression against Christians today, is because there is something happening around the world, and it's got to be stamped out. And yeah. the evil arises when the forcefulness of the gospel comes in. Look what, look what's, what's happening right here. Here you are. Here we are, live. People could be watching this globally, all over the world. All they are, yes, they are. Fifteen years, ten years ago, could this be done? No. Not without hundreds of thousands. Yeah, of dollars. Not at all. Right. right. It's this, this thing, this thing. That's right. Uh, it's no longer just a phone. I, I don't know when's the last. I called my wife because yesterday was our 
42nd wedding anniversary. Yeah, which and I, he's I'm, spending yeah, that yeah, dinner with us. He's spending with Apologia <laughs> Studios. Thank so, you so much, by the way, <laughs> Mrs. So, DeMar. Well, so what, you know, what can you do with this? The, the, the things on here that you can do are unbelievable. People say, oh, things aren't getting better and better. Well, some things are getting better and better, and these things that are getting better and better are for our benefit. Uh, we can do stuff with this that the Apostle Paul and Peter and the rest of them couldn't they would have been imagine. They would have been tripping yeah. if they could have, have spread the gospel all over the so, world in an instant. So my question is, what are Christians waiting for? And this is, now we're back to the Al Mohler thing yeah. about post-millennial. <laughs> yeah, and I got, got it. Yeah, I got it. Uh, maybe we may not even actually play it, but we'll talk about it at least. I, you know, he mentions the fact that there is, you know, evil in the world, and I forget what phrase he uses, the Supreme Court uses about... A kind of a new definition like of an ethics, evolution of, 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 ethics of morality and, of, and ethics okay yeah. which is i i agree with that yeah and and what is the ch what's the church's response to this his response is well the thing that's really going to save us is that the return of jesus and, and and the establishment of his kingdom he says yeah yeah now my question is two thousand years ago when the roman empire existed and all this other stuff was happening and the pilgrims Mm. We're doing what they were doing. The Puritans came, and Western civilization advanced because of the of the of the uh, of the advance of the gospel and the applying God's word to every area of life. What would have happened if the church had said that nearly two thousand years ago? Mm -hmm. We're we're just waiting. We can't do anything because it's inevitable. It's a prophetic inevitability. Yeah. You can't polish brass on a sinking ship. You don't rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's all going down, and as a result. We can't do anything. We right. just have to, you know, go into our churches and pray and so forth and so on, which I'm not saying you don't do. <coughs> but the thing is, it's our fault. Yeah. The problem isn't with the unbelievers. They're doing what unbelievers unbelieve right. and do. Right. It, the problem is with us because we don't believe that we can make, we can make changes. And people yeah. will say, look, look at all that's changed, which means if things have changed for the worse, at one time they were better. And the question is, why were they better? Mm. Is because Christians got involved in every mm. area of life and made things better. Then over, you look at the first colleges, Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Christian. Who, who yeah. owned those? Christians. Yeah. 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 What science. Happened? Yeah. It, what, yeah, science. <laughs> Christians. You, you, New, Isaac Newton, although he wasn't Trinitarian, but the man understood the, the, the application of... Um, Christian, Christian worldview. Yeah, Robert Boyle, chemistry. You can go through, you can go to the gauntlet. Pasteur mm -hmm. may not have been a Christian, but he understood God's creation. And by the way, if you, um, if you were going to have st surgery anytime soon and you're getting anesthesia and they're putting you to sleep, you can thank Genesis, the uh, first couple chapters for that, and the Christian doctor who read it and was like, when God was doing a major surgery on somebody... Put him to, to sleep. He put him to sleep. What are we doing keeping everyone awake for? Yeah, so that was what... That's <laughs> just what, that, bite, just that, bite this that's real what hard. That's what prompted anesthesiology, yeah. guys, was Genesis. So thank Jesus for anesthesia. Yeah, people think of the good old days. And there's... Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, O'Rourke, the comedian. He's, he says, when you think of the good old days, think dentistry. Uh, what dentistry was like. Oh, and, and today you go to the dentist, the guy knocks you out, drills holes in your teeth. And all that sort of thing fills them with stuff. And you go home. What? This was great, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a root can. I mean, a root can. Can you imagine getting a root canal 50, 60, yeah. 70 years they ago? They just yanked the tooth. Yeah. Yeah. Then the moral, the moral crisis we're facing is: Look, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm. This is. I'm going to tell you this. Here we are. Christians are sent. Ninety percent or more Christians are sending their children to schools yep. that teach the opposite of what. Christians say they teach, and then they're complaining about the world, and yet they're sending their kids to be educated. To be discipled by them. Yeah, it's, um, it's, the problem is us. God has laid everything that we need to do what we claim can be done is right in our hands. Uh, and, I, you know, it's, we are either going to learn this the easy way or we're going to learn it the hard way. That's right. That's right. And I will give you a couple verses to go check out for yourselves later in terms of the overall perspective of the Jews in terms of God's revelation coming to the, um, the entrance of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, was Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. El Gabor, the mighty God, the Father of eternity, coming of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. 
God's going to establish it, and uh, it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that will accomplish it. If you're like, how in the world is God going to increase peace and his governance in the world? Look at the world. Look at Drag Queen Story Hour. Look at all the stuff going on. It's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that accomplishes this. In terms of timing, Isaiah chapter 2, you can see when the kingdom of God is coming, all the nations even rise up to God's mountain, and his law goes forth from Zion. Daniel chapters, uh, just read Daniel, just read Daniel the whole book. I mean, it's not that long. You'll see even timing issues of when the kingdom of God is supposed to arise in history. Jesus actually said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You've got the promises of the kingdom all throughout the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 2, the Father says to the Son, ask of me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the very ends of the earth for your possession. question Dr. Bonson used to always bring up is, do you think Jesus forgot to ask the Father? Father says, ask me, I'll give them to you. And we know that he didn't forget. Jesus is uh, given the world. Psalm 22, the passion of the Messiah. He'll have his hands and feet pierced, his heart like wax, melted within him. They'll surround him like dogs. It's the passion of the Messiah in Psalm 22. But then it says that all the nations are going to return to worship Yahweh. Like as a result of the passion of the Messiah, all the nations return to worship God. You've got Psalm 72. You've got, he shall have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Psalm 110.1 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And it says, he shall, sorry, it says that um, uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand and I'll make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so that is the most quoted verse from the Old Testament in the New Testament. The most Mm -hmm. quoted from. Um, And somebody asked the question, and we'll wrap with this. Somebody asked the question. They said, um... So is Jesus going to return or not? Yeah. Well, in light of that psalm, and I only gave you a couple of smattering of verses there, just look at the apostolic divine interpretation of that. Psalm 110.1 is quoted in 1 Corinthians 15. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul gives the gospel, tells about Jesus dying and rising again from the dead. And then he says clearly, he says he's at the Father's side, and he says he must reign, Jesus, until... All of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. So he's presently reigning according to Paul in the first century, and he must reign until all of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. And then he says the last enemy to be defeated is death. So according to the Apostle Paul, divinely inspired apostolic interpretation of Psalm 110.1, he says Jesus is on his throne, and every enemy must first be placed under the feet of Jesus right. before death is finally put under his feet. So mm-hmm. it's every enemy and then death. That is the apostolic eschatology right there. Simplified Hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, it's as easy as it gets. Every enemy under the ruling king's feet, and then finally death is defeated. And so when someone says, is Jesus returning? Yep, he is, to destroy death and bring the final resurrection only after every enemy is defeated. That is what he teaches. Well, like a nice rug, I'm going to try to tie the room together here. Do it. So the the verse you read at the beginning, right, with the coastland waits for his law, um, I'm just thinking of, of John Knox. So I'm pretty sure this was John Knox. Obviously, we know who he was. He's basically credited for winning all of Scotland to Christ at one point. Um, he believed that that passage referred to Australia and New Zealand. We, we talked about this last year when we went there and stuff. But talking about just the work of Christians actually doing stuff, right, 200, 300 years ago, that's what they did. They, they were active, and they were trying to win nations to Christ. Australia, New Zealand, even Hawaii, they were established as Christian uh, Christian kingdom. kingdoms. Kingdoms. 20, at one, 20 years it took them to get yeah, to Hawaii. 20 and the, years. And so they were Christian nations in covenant with God. And, and then because of this terrible eschatology over the last century, it's it's led to the moral decline in those nations just like it has here. So I think it has a lot to do with it. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. We love to say that, by the way, because we planted a church in Kauai, that the Hawaiian kingdom in 20 years was won by the missionaries, and it was won to the degree that uh, 90-some-odd percent of the islands were professing faith in Jesus, and... Um, high education and literacy rate, and it had said in their constitution that no laws of the Hawaiian kingdom shall be at variance with the laws of Jehovah God. The name the Christian God in their constitution right. of the Hawaiian kingdom. Uh, so that's a that's a big deal. Um, hey, jo- uh, Joy, yes. do you have anything you wanted to ask Uncle Gary before we go into our? I'm just enjoying listening. Good. I really wish some of our YouTube. Listeners would listen. Listeners. Would listen. We're listening. Go back and listen again, <laughs> and be a good like like uh, like Uncle Gary says, be a Berean, and you check out what was said. Go test it, search the scriptures, right, see if what no, he's saying is so. But yeah, there's no reason to. Um, it would this 
our YouTube stream is sometimes the equivalent of people showing up willingly to like a classroom and then being like, I hate it here. <laughs> and like talking over the, the teacher and yeah. I don't know, like yeah. this is, we're here to like equip and encourage people and yeah. you know, so. And glorify God. Our point, listen, here's the deal. You're, you're watching believers on this broadcast right now that love this book. Right. This is God's word. We love this, the Savior, the Messiah, God in the flesh. We're Trinitarian. We believe salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. And what we're saying, the reason this is so important, is that this demonstrates that Jesus is the Messiah. That the atheists and those who actually use these verses to try to debunk Christ as Messiah, they're wrong. Jesus actually said these things. He meant them. Our goal here is to demonstrate that this book is from God. And these prophecies did come true. That's the point. Mm -hmm. okay. What's this? What's this? Well, that is a hat. Yes. That's our Heisenberg names. hat. That's a Heisenberg hat, yeah. So it's full of some names of people that um, purchased Reform Con tickets at the early bird rate. And Joy, what is Reform Con? Um, it is a conference that we're having in October 2019, the 24th to the 26th. Specifically. Where? Uh, here in Mesa, Mesa, Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. Um, you can find out all about it at reformcon.org. Mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, I really suggest going on there. I think we probably still have um, some discounts on rooms. We have food trucks coming. Um, it'll be a great event that you can attend. We're attempting to have some fun, but also keep it light so you don't feel like just sleeping you're being destroyed for three days uh, right right, right. <laughs> um but uh and it's obviously it's a great opportunity to meet people uh that you have maybe met on the internet and meet them in person or meet friends that you didn't know you had <laughs> um and it'll be i mean we have a great lineup of speakers too um and there are a variety of topics it's uh, Reformation in the public square. So, Reformation in the public square. Pastor Luke, who's coming? So for the first two days, it'll be yourself, Pastor James, uh, or Dr. White, if you don't know him as Pastor James. Yeah, Dr. White. Jeff may yeah. not know him as Pastor James. It's hard to do. I have a hard time with that, yeah. Uh, John Sampson, Andrew Sandlin, Toby Sumter, Darren Doan will be here. Cross Politics, Sheologians will be doing some stuff as a it, Joe Boot, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> Dr. Gary, jo Gary Dr. thinks that's funny. Thank Dr. You. Joe Boot, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then for the last day for the end abortion now day, um, again, you will be speaking. I'll be speaking. Uh, Pastor Zachary Conover will be speaking. That's, that's right. weird to say that. That's right. And yeah, usually he'd just be yeah. right at the end yeah, of the he's, building here, but now yeah. he's on a he's in Kauai, yeah, he's on an island. He's serving the Hawaiian people, <laughs> bringing the gospel to him. And then Rusty Thomas, Rusty Thomas, and, and we will be. Uh, uh, premiering yes. babies are still murdered here that's right so so if you guys come to reform con you are going to get to see babies are murdered here too before, before anybody else, else yeah. does and so we're going to do it together and prepare for next um, year's mission together as churches really globally bringing the gospel into conflict with the issue of abortion we told you guys that for everybody that got the early bird um, discount and, and got your tickets for reform con that we would put you into a drawing and here you are right here in our nice heisenberg hat uh, we'll put you into a drawing uh, for us to take you out to dinner uh, that week. You guys come out for Reform Con. You will get to have dinner with uh, Pastor Luke, myself, uh, probably Joy, uh, maybe Pastor Zach, maybe Wilson. Pastor Zach. I'm not sure. Morgan, uh, Doctor. Some speakers. Yeah, that's right. Maybe some speakers with with us. So actually, let's let's do this. I'm going to reach in. See, I'm not looking right now. I'm not looking. I'll grab. I'll grab. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I got one. I got first name is Mario Jimenez. Mario Jimenez. That's Very our nice. first winner. You're going to dinner with us at Reform Con. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to look in here so no one thinks I'm, you know, cheating or anything like that. Let me so see here. We're going to McDonald's, right? That's what McDonald's. Mickey D's, <laughs> y'all. Mickey D's. Um, here we go. We got Tom. Make sure I say his name right. Oh, that's, of course, it's a really hard name. Tom Kondratiuk. Kondratiuk. Okay, you're going to have to tell me how to say that when you get here. Tom, you got it. And uh, let's, do, let's do two more. Sound good? Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's do two more. Okay, here we go. And who we got here? We got uh, Brian Spielman. Brian Spielman. And let's see. I'm going to try to get from the very bottom here. Brian Spielman, you're up. And then also, let's see here. Matthew Dryling. 
Yeah, I said that right. I think D-R-E-I-L-I-N-G. Yes, and let's do one more. Let's do one more. I'm feeling I'm generous. Feeling generous. Today, I'm super I guess. generous here. Let's see here. Let's go. One more. And we got Steven Verlotz. Verlotz, V-E-R-L-A-U-T-Z. Verlotz, there you go. You guys get dinner with us at ReformCon, guys. And don't forget, everyone, get your tickets for ReformCon. ReformCon.org. Well, just, so, just so you guys know, um, our last, the last two that we pulled... Um, are, do appear to be a part of a couple. Okay. So don't worry, we won't make you go alone. Leave your wife. You can bring your. Spouse. You guys just have to share. You might have to <laughs> share your, a meal. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Bring your spouse. We'll take care of you guys. All right. I'm giving these a joy. So Gary you can contact Demar. them until they know. Gary Demar, guys, get him at AmericanVision.org. I highly recommend. Highly, highly, highly recommend getting his stuff. Fill your library with his books. Go do it now. Don't do it later. Do it my right favorite, now. My favorite isn't even a post-millennial thing. The God and Government books are Yes! Like, we I didn't mean, even touch that. Just we didn't even do it. Go get those right now, right away. Yes. God and Government. <laughs> How long did it take you to write that book? I wrote uh, the first one in 82, the second one in 84, and the third one in 86. So, so I, I wrote the first one, and I sent it to a friend, and he made all these notes, and he says, Gary, you need, you need to cover these things. So I wrote a second volume. So mm -hmm. I sent him the second volume, and he said, Gary, now you need to cover these things. <laughs> and so I didn't send him the third volume. So mm -hmm. I only did... So now it's in a single volume without the question and answer gotcha. format. Yeah. It's just like a regular book. And that's like a th about a thousand pages, isn't it? Nah, it's about 800 pages. 800, okay. With, but the they're pictures. And answer are, There's pictures. They're great. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're the best. Get them. Definitely do get them. And uh, God, so God and government, you've got um, tons here. I mean, I'll tell you guys right now, what you, right now what you have to get. I'm looking at the store right now for American Vision. So if you guys are you know watching this later, you know, take notes, write it down. God and government, for sure, you need that. Um, I would definitely get, um, and it's on the site. Uh, you can get it other places too, but it's, uh, you need to get this book. If you want an overall big picture kind of thing, he shall have dominion by, uh, Dr. Ken Gentry, get that book. And then of course, any of, uh, Gary's books he has on end time stuff, make sure you pick those up, whether it's, um, um, whether it's Last Day's Madness, that's always a classic, and um, whether it's uh, what's the what's the other is Jesus coming soon? Is Jesus coming soon? Wars and rumors of wars, wars and rumors of wars. Left Behind, separating fact from fiction, was the one little book we talked about at the beginning that had a huge impact on me. Just go get them all. I mean, seriously, fill your library up. You're going to be blessed. Gary is a phenomenal writer, and he's great at systematizing things and helping to understand it, bringing it down to all everyone's level so it's fa it's a fantastic fantastic and I'll, look i always tell people if you buy the book you read the book if you have a question you can email me and i'll do, do my best to answer but if you don't read the book and ask me a question if it's in the book i'm going to tell you to go get the book yes and i don't make any money on the books so this isn't just to sell books <laughs> so line my pocket so okay that's that's a that's a big that's a big commitment guys and uh i like i said if, if you guys have been blessed by the ministry of apologia church uh, apologia studios you need to know there are all kinds of little steps that get us all to where we're at within god's plan and providence in our lives and uh, if not for gary demar this wouldn't exist apologia studios no. apologia church i mean eschatology shapes your perspective of the future Absolutely. and what i learned from uncle gary through all of his books in the scriptures um, changed my mind and my heart about the future and that's why this exists eschatology matters it matters a lot so make sure you guys go pick them up and just know that we are working with uh, Gary the next two days on a lot of content. Yes. We guys hope you guys will get to see some stuff for Abortion exciting. Now, some stuff for Academy tonight. He'll be on next week with Jeff Durbin tomorrow night. Very excited. He's with us for two more days. Pray for him. Uh, pray for us. We'll catch you guys next time right here on Apologia Radio.